because the establishment media have generally ignored Three Mile Island in their discussion of the Chernobyl nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, we're going to replay a program we did back in April of 1982 in which we looked very closely at Three Mile Island. If it would have melted down, it would have probably have wiped out the entire eastern seaboard from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia to New York City. At the time of the accident, there were seven radiation monitoring devices placed around the plant. Only two of those were operational. The monitoring devices that were on the stacks of the containment building at the time of the accident had a top reading of 1,000 millirems. They were off scale for better than three, three days after the accident began. So, in effect, we really don't know exactly how much radiation we have received. I do know that in the nine months after the accident, the infant mortality rate, miscarriages, and hypothyroid diseases amongst young children went up tenfold. Um, in the areas that the plume passed over, yes, and I have seen some of those animals, such as Siamese cows being born, and cows with three legs, a cow with an eye in the middle of its forehead a cat with no bones in the back of its body and things of that nature. It was very sad. What happened at Three Mile Island and what has happened since tonight on Alternative Views. Have you seen those bumper stickers which say, less people were hurt at Three Mile Island than at Chappaquiddick? What's the truth to that? Doug, we have a, a guest tonight who's going to let us know. Yes, we're happy to have as our special guest tonight on Alternative Views, Randy King, an anti-nuclear activist. Randy was an energy management consultant at the time of the accident at Three Mile Island and was soon after dismissed from his com company when he refused to work on a Three Mile Island board control panel. Since then, he's become active in a lot of anti-nuclear groups and is traveling around the country organizing as part of the anti-nuclear movement. So Randy, welcome to Alternative Views. Thank you. Could you, to refresh our memories about the Three Mile Island accident, tell us a little bit about it. You were actually living there at the time and experienced firsthand the Three Mile Island accident. What really happened there? Well, in the morning of March 28, 1979, through a combination of technical errors and human errors, the worst commercial nuclear accident in the history of the nuclear power industry developed. That accident brought the core of Unit 2 reactor to within a half an hour of melting down. And what would have happened had it melted down? If it would have melted down, it would have probably have wiped out the entire eastern seaboard from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia to New York City. My God, you, uh, how is that possible? I mean, what, what would have happened? Well, if the core would have melted down, it would have melted through the bottom of the containment building, which was a four-foot thick concrete structure, and hit the water table beneath the island and exploded in radioactive steam. The radioactive steam would have then dispersed throughout the entire eastern seaboard. How close was there actually a accident? How close were we to an accident? We were within 30 minutes of a meltdown, a full-scale meltdown. There was some melting that took place within the core and it is still in that state today. However, they have been able to control the chain reaction through a borated water solution which minimizes the amount of criticality that takes place within the core itself. But the problem could develop and that thing could still melt down sometime in the future. Now, is the wide area of destruction you mentioned, is that just unique to that place or could it happen at any nuclear power plant? Well, it would depend time? upon the air patterns at the time and which way the wind was blowing and whatnot, but that's fairly normal <coughs> for any nuclear power plant, yes. 
For instance, there's one in Dallas and the one that may or may not ever be gotten off the ground in okay. um, the South uh, Texas Nuclear Project. Right. What would be the destruction, destructive area if they were to melt down? In any given direction, approximately 200 miles. So that means if Dallas went, it could take out Austin. Yes. Randy, what were some of the impact on the environment and human life from Three Mile Island? How much radiation were people exposed to and what were the consequences of this? Well, the exact amount of radiation that we were exposed to will probably never be fully determined and the actual effects that the accident has had on us will probably never be determined either. At the time of the accident, there were seven radiation monitoring devices placed around the plant. Only two of those were operational. The monitoring devices that were on the stacks of the containment building at the time of the accident had a top reading of 1,000 millirems. They were off scale for better than three, three days after the accident began. So, in effect, we really don't know exactly how much radiation we have received. I do know that in the nine months after the accident, the infant mortality rate, miscarriages, and hypothyroid diseases amongst young children went up tenfold. Of human beings in the of area. human beings, yes. I've seen some pictures in the Village Voice of animals, a lot of miscarriages or strange creatures that were born from animals, yes. deformities of certain sorts. Have you seen any of these, and yes, was this a widespread phenomenon? Um, in the areas that the plume passed over, yes, and I have seen some of those animals, such as Siamese cows being born, and cows with three legs, a cow with an eye in the middle of its forehead a cat with no bones in the back of its body, and things of that nature. It was very sad. Um, one specific, specific thing where the plume passed over, it was about an acre wide area and it hit some trees and some of the trees had leaves on one side and no trees on, or no leaves on the other side. So there's no question that a lot of radioactivity was released from Three Mile Island and it's had lethal effects. Yes. Well, there have been uh, radioactivity uh, placed into the water of the Susquehanna River, right? Um, during the time of the accident, 2,000 gallons were released into the river. Immediately afterwards, one of the anti-nuclear groups that sprang up, the Susquehanna Valley Alliance, held an intervention on the dumping of water into the river, and they were successful in preventing any more water from being dumped into the river from the accident. Have there been any indications of negative results from this, from damage being done either to ecology or to animals or to people because of the dumping into the water? Uh, just just in those infant mortality syndrome and the studies that were taken, most of those cases developed in Lancaster City and Lancaster mm -hmm. County, which is downriver from Three Mile Island, and they get their drinking water from the river. Randy, could you give us some insight into how this affected you personally and made you an anti-nuclear activist? At the time of the Three Mile Island accident, you were this energy management consultant, and your firm was working with the Three Mile Island nuclear installation. Were you anti-nuke at that time or was it only after the Three Mile Island experience that you became the anti-nuclear activist that you now are? At the time of the accident, I was not anti-nuclear. I wasn't entirely pro-nuclear. I was somewhat ambivalent. Um, the day after the accident began, I went to see the China Syndrome. And the China Syndrome had opened in the Harrisburg area on the day of the accident. Oh, uncanny. I left the theater in a state of shock and realized that the general attitude of the people, the utility executives in that movie, was exactly what we were dealing with in the central Pennsylvania area at that time. From that point on, it became a personal crusade of mine to never let that happen again. And that is the general feelings of quite a few people in the central Pennsylvania area. We feel that it is our responsibility, since we have experienced this and been through it, to try and prevent it from happening somewhere else. And that is why I'm in Texas speaking. And that is why I will be traveling around the country talking to other people, as are my brothers and sisters in the Three Mile Island area. Could you say a few things about the claim you made that the Three Mile Island incident was similar to the China Syndrome? First of all, was there the same sort of attitude of the corporation that was producing nuclear energy yes. that was interested in profit before yes. human life. Is that, was that what you were alluding to? Just one to? of callous indifference to the general feelings and insensitiveness to the people of the area. They seem to feel that the people of the area are basically ignorant about nuclear power, and that is certainly not the case. For instance, 
They found radioactive rat droppings in the containment building last year. They quickly said that there was no danger to the public safety and that none of the rats had left the island. And we asked, how did they know none of the rats have left the island? Do they take roll call every morning? That pretty much explains how GPU deals with the general public. Were you a member of the population that was evacuated after Three Mile Island? How did you experience this negatively or psychologically when you learned that there might have been a threat to your own life? I was not forcefully evacuated. Only pregnant women and children under the age of six within a five mile radius of the plant were evacuated, but I did evacuate. I woke up about 9 o'clock in the morning, turned on the radio, and heard that there had been significant releases of radiation to the environment. I was gone about a half hour later. That was a very quick conversion then, wasn't it, to an anti yes, it was. Stance. After we left the movie that evening, we did some reading and, talk and talked about evacuating that evening. We decided to wait until the next day and, and then make a final decision as soon as we awakened the next day. Did, what does that make you feel, the fact that you couldn't have the time bomb ticking in you right now. I'm resigned to it. Are most people up there? I've read studies where the, 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 the people, there's a high degree of anxiety and of the people up there. Oh, that's the very true. Psychological stress has taken a tremendous t toll on the people of the area. And if any physical effects do in fact show up, the first is going to be the effects of psychological stress, the general anxiety, the distrust of government and utilities, um, nervous problems, gastro gastrointestinal problems, things of that nature. But yet the people are organizing against nuclear energy there. and against, well, We are organized. Right, against Three Mile Island being open. Can you say a little bit about this? How did you begin your organizational okay. efforts? At the time of the accident, there was one anti-nuclear group in the central Pennsylvania area. That was Three Mile Island Alert. They had about 15 members. A week after the accident, they had 2,000 members. Three months later, there were six anti-nuclear groups in the area with approximately 25,000 members. Three years later, there are now eight anti-nuclear groups in the central Pennsylvania area with about 40,000 members, all total. Immediately after the accident, we set about trying to keep Unit 1 shut down. Unit 1 was down for refueling at the time of the accident. The NRC ordered it, kept shut down until they had determined that it would be safe to operate. A number of interventions were undertaken then by all of the anti-nuclear groups, and the Three Mile and Public Interest Resource Center was founded, and the Three Mile and Legal Fund. The Three Mile and Legal Fund's responsibility was to disperse funds to the different anti-nuclear groups to undergo the interventions. Interventions were undertaken on plant design, emergency management, um, management competency, the venting of Krypton, and so on and so forth. There has been a two and a half year hearing process then that has taken place, and those hearings all drew to a close in late October of last year. And what came out of these hearings? What was revealed? The Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, which heard the hearings, by and large, said that the anti-nuclear interventions were a waste of time and money and that they had needlessly postponed the restart of Unit 1. One case in point, the interventions on, emergent, or on management competency. One week after the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board issued GPU a clean bill of health on their management competency, two operators were caught cheating on their licensing tests. Mm -hmm. Four of them failed those tests, so they had to reopen the hearings and retest the operators under more stringent procedures. Half of the operators then failed their test later, so the actual results of that operator cheating and scandal will not be known for some time until those hearings are concluded. They are expected to conclude sometime around the end of this month. The evacuation planning was another major issue there are five counties surrounding Three Mile Island, and all were required to draw up evacuation plans within a 10-mile radius of the plant. Most of the evacuation plans stipulate that this plan may not work in the event of a nuclear accident because they are expected to draw in volunteer firemen and people, just generally volunteers, to help with the evacuation they have said, those volunteers, that they will not participate in that, that they will get their friends and family out first and then maybe come back in. The city of Harrisburg 
which is the largest city close to Three Mile Island, has only 60,000 people in it, the 10 mile radius would have split the city in half. Instead of including Harrisburg in the evacuation plans, they felt that it would be impossible to evacuate that many people. So they drew the boundaries two miles short, about eight miles, and I live one block on the other side of the evacuation line now. So it's basically the evacuation plans were constituted just for the contingencies of practicality right. of evacuating rather than the concern for the health and welfare and well-being of the people. Absolutely. And you think this is typical of both the political process that's governed nuclear energy as well as the corporate process of producing it. I think it could even go a bit further into civil defense planning. I think our federal government may be preparing for a nuclear war, and this is one way of preparing for it without letting the general public know really what they are doing. Could you elaborate on that? I didn't. Well, around nuclear power plants mm -hmm. now, they are putting up siren systems, civil defense siren systems. They are getting these evacuation plans together, and it just seems like there's more to what is really going on than mm -hmm. what they are telling us about. What about government? industry collusion and cover-ups in the case of Three Mile Island. There is a lot of talk about that before and after the situation occurred. Okay. The federal government, of course, under the auspices of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which was split off from the Atomic Energy Commission to regulate nuclear, en nuclear energy instead of promoting it, the Presidential Commission on Three Mile Island found that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was more often promoting nuclear power than actually regulating it. Part of the problem that we have faced is the lack of cleanup that is taking place. At the time of the accident, General Public Utilities had $300 million in insurance money, and they predicted that cleanup process would take $40 million and six months. Six months later, it was $400 million and five years. Several months ago, it was one and a half billion dollars in 18 to 20 years. They have no money to clean up Three Mile Island now. The federal government says it will not give them any money to clean it up. So now the ratepayers are being saddled with it. Their rates have gone up some 70 percent. We feel that the utility in the nuclear industry and nuclear utilities around the country and the federal government, either through funding or through legislation, requiring the nuclear industry to pay for the cleanup is what should happen. Is it even possible to envisage a cleanup if it costs a one point half whatever billion dollars? I mean, it seems we economically so. uh, insane. Uh, so. In other words, you want the cleanup, but you don't want the plant to reopen. Oh, heavens no. Right. No. But if they clean up, then obviously they're going to want to open the plant. Right. Um, there, that just takes them to the point of decontaminating and removing what has been damaged in there. What they do after that is totally beyond that one and a half billion figure. Well, how far have they actually proceeded with the cleanup? At the time of the accident, they dumped some 800,000 gallons of water into the floor of the containment building. The only real cleanup that has been done is that water has been processed through what's called the submerged mineralizer system and most of the radioactivity has been taken out of it except for tritium. It is now stored on tanks on the island. And that is basically about what has been done. And what needs to be done to make it safe? Um, radioactivity levels within the containment structure itself and the pressure vessel are very high, almost lethal, if not incredibly lethal. They are not quite certain what the actual levels are because the monitors were knocked out of commission. Um, what needs to be done now is the whole building needs to be decontaminated. The reactor core needs to be removed. Is it possible they don't even have a decontamination process? Have they ever had a spill, an accident on this scale before? No. We, we know, for instance, that they don't know how to uh, dispose of the waste from the nuclear plant, that they don't have a technology or a process to eliminate this to make it safe and harmless. Could it be the same thing for the contamination of a plant on the scale of Three Mile Island? Have you looked into this? They have done a great deal of planning mm -hmm. and preparations for the cleanup of Three Mile Island. However, the point is that once they start doing it and get further into it, they may encounter things that they were totally unaware of. Right. They have a good guideline to begin with, we feel, but it's by no means the bottom line. So even if uh, the one and a half billion dollar figures may not be the end of the road. Oh, absolutely not. So it could cost billions of dollars, and the consumers are being forced to pay for this yes. through higher rates. 
Do the consumers have any alternatives or any course of action they can take? What we are currently organizing is the Project David Ratepayer Strike. That was launched several weeks ago. We are asking people, basically symbolically, to withhold one month's electric bill from the Metropolitan Edison Company. The response that we have gotten from it has been overwhelming. In the first five days, it was over $100,000. Now we are two weeks into the rate strike. I called our office today, and we are over $200,000. We are getting between ten dollars and $20,000 worth of bills a day in our canvassing operation. On March 28th, at the third anniversary at the state capitol, we will hold a ratepayers congress and decide at that point whether to continue the rate strike or not. Is this the crux of your organizing efforts now? You're a member of the March 28th coalition and the director for the last resort. Is that some of the activities? The Project David is a campaign being undertaken by the March 28th coalition. The last resort is a direct action campaign that will be aimed against the state government, the utility, and the federal government if they attempt to restart Unit 1 probably culminating in a blockade of Three Mile Island if they attempt to restart it. What's the status of, of nuclear power plants either in operation or under construction around the country now? I've read where economically it's going down the tubes. Construction has just uh, uh, almost come to a halt in a lot of places. The NRC has ordered what, the one at uh, Diablo Canyon, was that the yes, one in yes. California? Yes, California. The license was right. rescinded. Uh, it looks like there's a pretty rough time for the nuclear industry, and yet, on the other hand, Reagan is saying full speed ahead on nukes. Well, I hate to say anything about dear Ronnie, but <laughs> he ahead. said um, just recently county commissioners have said that have put referendums on restart on our ballots for the May primary. Ronald got involved in that and said that he felt that the citizens of central Pennsylvania didn't have enough information to vote on restart, whether they wanted it or not. He said that we were basically ignorant. The day after that, there was an unusual event at the island, and technicians went in and discovered higher than normal levels of combustible gases, specifically hydrogen and methane. When you say the word hydrogen in central Pennsylvania, people scatter very quickly. We called the White House to find out what they knew. They didn't know anything, so we told the White House. We are doing that frequently now, calling the White House and asking them information, and they don't know anything, so we tell them. Randy, could you say a few things about that February problem or danger at Three Mile Island? Afterwards, after they, first of all, it appeared that this was going to be one of the major catastrophes in history, sort of a replay or even worse of the first. Then they said, well, this was just radio transmission interference. There was really no problem there. We just read our dials wrong. Could you give us some background or information on that? Um, at approximately 9 o'clock in the morning on that Friday morning, two technicians went into the containment building. The instruments that they had with them detected lower than normal levels of oxygen, which is normally about 20 percent, and higher than normal levels of combustible gases, specifically hydrogen and methane. Throughout the day, they were unsure of what to do. They began venting the containment building to the atmosphere to control this buildup of gases. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they went back again and detected it once again. Then at 5.30, they finally issued a press release announcing it to the general public and calling for an unusual event. So there was that long of delay. If it would have been a serious problem, there would have been that much time in between before the general public would have known about it. At 5.30, when it finally broke on the news, hysteria reached incredible proportions. I went into our offices and was on the phone for the mm -hmm. rest of the evening trying to console people. Mm -hmm. People didn't know what to do. They were calling asking, what do we do? Where do we go? All we could tell them was, get your gas tank filled up and be prepared, because we weren't sure either. Mm -hmm. Then at 9.30 that evening, they held a press conference and said that it was radio transmission, transmissions from two-way radios that the technicians were carrying that were giving the false readings. We believe that that is true, that is actually what happened, but that is indicative of the problems that we have been facing there at Three Mile Island. You know, in Austin, first, ironically enough, we were coming up for a vote on whether to pull out a South Texas nuclear project. During the Three Mile Island thing, it was voted down. I mean, they voted to keep the nuke at that time, much to the surprise of a lot of people. This was done mainly on the dangers of nuclear power. 
the environment, et cetera, and to individuals. But it wasn't until the obvious economic problems came up and the mismanagement of the South Texas nuclear project came up that Austin people voted it down, which indicates to me that people still are not as afraid of the first part as they are of the economics of it, which seems to me rather strange. I agree that that's sad that it takes that form, but it would appear as if we are going to defeat nuclear power on the economic issues well, it's associated going to defeat with itself it. as an economically yes. unviable form of energy. The Harvard Business Review wrote a famous article mm -hmm. which did an analysis of the economic feasibility of different energy sources and nuclear energy was one of the most uneconomic and they recommended a discontinuation of nuclear energy. And the head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission himself said if you vote for nuclear power, you're voting for the great increases in electrical rates. That's true. There's another aspect of nuclear power I think we should look into, and that's the great proliferation of it overseas. Uh, there was nuclear power, there's nuclear power going in in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Strangely enough, there was a court case recently in which some people intervened in the United States to try to prevent the U.S. company from selling the Philippines, this nuclear reactor, and building it for them. The judge ruled that there was, that the people had no status, that they could not interfere in an American company because they were putting it in overseas, not in the United States. Another situation, part of the same phenomenon, is the fact I've read where nuclear power is being raised up in Mexico and they want to start building nukes. But I wonder first time I thought about that, hey, that's crazy. They've seen, you know, it's economically bad, it's no They've good. They've got all that oil. They're the fourth major oil producer. And the world. then I saw an article where it said Argentina has the nuke. They have the bomb. Do you think these third world countries are doing this mainly so that they can get the bomb? Technology for nuclear weapons. Oh, and the bomb, Rather than the energy itself. Oh, absolutely, yes. Randy, are your group, do your groups try to educate the public on the relationship between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, that these things can't be separated. When I grew up in the 50s, we had Atoms for Peace, where you had on one hand peaceful, safe nuclear energy, and on the other hand you had destructive atomic bombs, whereas now we see that nuclear energy is as dangerous, as lethal as nuclear weapons potentially. But one also shouldn't remember, shouldn't forget that the problem is not only nuclear power, but also nuclear weapons. Is your group making this a... In the past, we have been fairly single issue oriented. Mm -hmm. It is somewhat easier for people to deal with an issue if that is all that you deal with. Mm -hmm. um, now we are leaning more and more towards making the connection, and there is a very obvious connection there. The federal government is trying to pass legislation that would take all of the waste from nuclear power plants, take it to reprocessing centers, and turn it into weapons-grade plutonium. All right. This could be one of the reasons why nuclear energy might be pursued in the United States, is to have this spin-off right. for nuclear weapons technology, so that the people have to be educated about the insanity of nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. as well as nuclear Absolutely. power. We've had quite a bit of this in Austin recently. There's a lot of good anti-war. Harrisburg and Hiroshima are sister cities. Mm. What about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what about fusion? You hear some people say that fusion is the thing of the future because fusion will give us great stuff. It's like the sun and um, it doesn't have any of the bad side effects of regular nuclear power, and yet Helen Caldescott said that that's not true. Well, fusion still breeds radioactive waste. And as long as there's going to be radioactive waste that's going to have to be stored for thousands and thousands of years, I don't think that we should pursue that course. I think if all of the money that were to go into fusion research and fission research were to be put into alternative renewable resources, the entire country would have, every household would have a solar system inside of five years. Randy, what do you see as the alternative energy system for America? What do you envisage? as alternatives that will meet the energy needs of the country. I think the first thing that's going to have to happen is a general change in the mindset of the people of this country about the energy that they use, where it comes from and how they use it, and what it does to the environment when it's produced and when it's used. Once that happens, when people are more aware of what goes into turning on a light switch and whatnot, I think conservation will take such a dramatic toll 
in the amount of electricity that is generated in this country or energy that is used, that from that point, alternative renewable resources such as solar and wind and cogeneration and hydro will more than enough supply our energy needs. You have a movie which we're going to take a look at. Can you give us some background on it before we see it? Yes, the movie was made by the Shadow Lights in New York City and it is a collection of press conferences, uh, radio statements, and interviews with people around the Three Mile Island area at the time of the accident. Most of the things in the movie I heard on the radio or saw on television and it was a very frightening time for me and for many others. The reports that we were getting were so conflicting that nobody was really sure of what was going on. I think in general we tended to disbelieve everything that the utility said and that tended to increase our level of paranoia. Well, let's take a look at it, the movie. Okay. is running around trying to find the third guy. Uh, they already got two. They're trying to find the third guy in the plot to steal a nuclear-powered submarine and possibly destroy an eastern city with a nuclear missile. I mean, this is real stuff. This isn't out of the comics. This is on the, on the news tonight. Uh, three guys tried to steal a nuclear sub and blow up an eastern city with a nuclear missile. And uh, they don't say which city, but I mean, which one would you do if you were going to blow up a city in the east? And here we are sitting here listening to the fine tunes and stuff. That is what I call nuclear apathy. It's something we all suffer from in the, uh, in the post-World War II generation, you know, people that were born in the 50s and, and 60s, I guess. Nuclear apathy. Really? Who cares? We could blow up the whole world in 10 seconds. Who cares? What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? Um, four minutes now left to go. I've been getting a... Uh, rise several hundred feet in the air. You can see it from the lights uh, 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 around the plant, a white steam. And it roared. An accident in the water cooling system at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, forced the company to call a general emergency and shut down part of the plant for an unspecified period. It roared uh, with a, uh, a tremendous uh, roar of releasing steam. It woke me up, uh, and uh, I looked out the window and I saw this uh, huge column going up in the air and roaring. Everything is under control. There is and was no danger to public health and safety. There was a small release of radiation to the environment. All safety equipment functioned properly. Metropolitan Edison has been monitoring the air in the vicinity of the plant constantly since the incident. No increase in normal radiation levels has been detected. It is my feeling that the people within the radius of a few miles, especially pregnant women, should be told that there is a significantly increased risk to their babies and that women who are carrying babies should be evacuated from within a few mile radius around that plant. Nothing is riskless, but uh, uh, when one weighs the risks overall, the advantages of nuclear power exceed the risks. The situation is more complex than the company first led us to believe. We are taking more tests, and at this point we believe there is still no danger to the public health. Metropolitan Edison has given you and us conflicting information. The new information is this. The accident sent ionized radiation beaming through the plant's four-foot thick walls. Consequently, the metal shield that protects the nuclear fuel may have been damaged. There is continuing gamma radiation coming out, 
but the readings that I obtained in the, uh, on the way here from the airport indicate that it is not just direct radiation from the reactor, which uh, in fact goes down briefly when you go behind a mountain, but it is in fact to a large extent not decreasing this distance to a very rapid degree the way you would expect from an inverse square law. So what we're dealing with is fallout, plain old bomb kind of fallout. And the source of leakage radiation is coming from our auxiliary building and some water that's uh, accumulated on the floor. We're presently pumping that up, that'll be contained in tanks. And once that's accomplished, well then the, the radiation level releases uh, should be should stop. The only way it will show up will probably be in the milk. There will be small increases in radioactive iodine in the milk because there is a an accumulation factor in the milk just like there was during the fallout incident. Uh, we have absolutely no question about the safety of nuclear plants as a result of this mishap. We do not refer to it as a nuclear accident because it was not that. And uh, as I say, all these systems went into operation as they should have. Uh, we think the record of the nuclear industry stands for itself. No amount of, of um, a radioactive iodine should be added to the diet of a pregnant mother or a young baby. Uh, the principal concern is that the material goes to the thyroid and will ever so slightly uh, lower the function of the thyroid and it can lead uh, to some degree of uh, retardation and growth, not tremendously serious, it would be difficult to detect, but it can lead to some degree of uh, mental retardation and that's why it is not a good idea during times when there's radioactive fallout in the air from bomb testing or from nuclear releases uh, to use fresh milk if one is pregnant. Ionizing radiation changes the electrical charge and the chemicals in your cell. It bombards the living tissue. It damages the cell membrane. It produces mutant viruses and it changes the genetic code itself. I guess I feel like we're victims and there's not much we can do about it. And I do feel angry because I have a little girl and I live a quarter mile away. We do have a new development. Uh, it is not clear yet the extent of this development. There was an uncontrolled release of uh, radiation from the facility approximately 20 minutes ago. We were notified by the island. Right now, I think the wind has shifted and uh, I don't know. I. I'm getting my radiological man in now. He's supposed to come in, and we have a Geiger counter. We want to check things development out. And instructed them to uh, develop a uh, higher state of readiness with the possibility of evacuation. The whole idea of being ab able to evacuate communities that size is absurd. It's been absurd all along, and it's just governmental and utility nonsense to talk about being able to cope with a situation by evacuation because you're never going to get the people out. We are advising the people on the basis of information, on the basis of a recommendation from the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that they simply ought to stay indoors as a precautionary measure, you know, until they hear further word from us. Yeah, it's that simple. This is part of a fraud. Sure, somebody in one little region may close their windows and escape part of the dose, but it's going to spread out over the whole area and you're going to pay a price with more people getting a smaller dose a little further down. The area should be evacuated. Uh, I would say certainly the immediate area, the Goldsboro area, the Middleton area, uh, should be evacuated uh, uh, in terms of Harrisburg. I yeah, a lot of people are leaving the Harrisburg area right now. Uh, my own family's on the way to New York City right now to stay with relatives. Uh, a lot of people, the gas stations are flooded. The banks were busy. People were throwing some of their money so they could get out of here. We closed all the uh, windows in the building, like we've been told, and we've turned off all our univent, univent heating and uh, conditioning system. We had uh, no release of radioactive iodine, for example. Now, this has not generally been mentioned, that the safety systems did work for uh, capturing the most potent uh, uh, effect of a nuclear disaster, which is the widespread release of radioiodine. The release, the release that was made, there may have been xenon, but xenon can be released to water if it's within acceptable limits. The release that was made yesterday was within the limits that were acceptable and was 
I don't know what. I don't know why we need to we need to, to tell you each and everything that, that, that we do. Specifically when we make Mr. We certainly feel responsible to the people that live around the plant. But one of the things that the people that live around the plant have to recognize is that we have to get on with our jobs. Well, to tell you the truth, it doesn't bother me. I'm not. <laughs> if those things happen, they happen. And that's the way I feel about it. I think they're keeping a lot away from us. They're not letting us know the uh, seriousness of the situation. Our prime concern is the safety of the people of central Pennsylvania. And in order to assess what we must do to protect their safety, we need accurate information. I was asked by the federal government, given a budget of three and a half million dollars a year and 150 people at the Livermore Lab, to find out for them just what the effects of radiation are on people. We need accurate information. And I think the president uh, agreed with me that, that uh, we needed a better capability. After the six years of work, we came out with one report that for any unit of radiation, any amount that you give a person or a group of people, what will be the cancer and leukemia risk? And we said that it would be 20 times as bad as anyone had estimated before. And promptly, the government attempted to harass us, and they took away my colleagues, 12 of us, 13 people, and in a variety of moves, attempted in every way to harass us. In other words, they were happy to give me three and a half million dollars a year so long as I never said anything was harmful. We're trying to keep everyone informed on an ongoing basis. Uh, we're on special alert. We don't know if there are going to be further uncontrolled emissions. I don't like the sound of depressurizing, letting that bubble creep down into the core. Not yet. I don't think we want to depressurize yet. The, the latest burst didn't uh, didn't hurt many people. I'm not sure why you're not moving people. Gotta say it. I've been saying it down here. I, I don't know what we're protecting at this point. I think we ought to be moving people. How far out? How far out? Well, I get them downwind, and unfortunately the wind is still meandering. And, uh, at these dose levels, that's probably not bad because it's dispersing. Yeah. But south, south, how far? I don't think they're going to kill any people out to 10 miles. There aren't that many people, and these people have been, they've had two days to get ready, and they scared. 40,000. Based on advice of the chairman of the NRC, and in the interest of taking every precaution, I am advising those who may be particularly susceptible to the effects of any radiation, that is, pregnant women and preschool-aged children, to leave the area within a five-mile radius of the Three Mile Island facility until further notice. Well, I'm Dad, frightened. Dad, I live uh, over there right. in the next street in the apartment over there, but now I'm frightened. I'm frightened, to tell you the truth. Are you going to leave? Uh, no, I got no other place to go. I'm a widower. Or let me stress once again that the historic record of nuclear power has been an excellent one. This is the first significant nuclear accident that we have experienced uh, in power plant operations in this country over they a history. They are claiming that nothing happens to the workers in these plants, and they're claiming that the people living next to the bomb test, nothing happened to them, and this government is going to take us over the cliff if we let it. We are told the failure was mild, which raises the question, what would have occurred if the safety systems were severely taxed? I am concerned, Mr. Speaker, and want to understand what reason I now have in believing that other nuclear plants in the country are safe for the people living around. After the fact, I think most people have realized that these accidents have actually shown that the design of nuclear plants is as is claimed, that they are designed to accommodate just about any imaginable mechanical or human error. I'll speculate, but I do not know that there were multiple failures because I doubt that one uh, would have gotten into this situation with a single, say, a valve man, uh, malfunctioned or a single uh, pump malfunction. What's it been like here uh, since Wednesday?
conflicting statements from the governor's office, the NRC here, the NRC in Washington, and the company Metropolitan Edison that owns the plant. There's been a severe communications problem uh, getting information back to Washington. I was there. I think we're very close to a, a chaotic situation. Part of it, I think, is a lack of credibility of what we're being told. Part of it's the confusion that's coming forth. I think it's inexcusable that we leave a private utility in full command of the situation. Uh, being advised and pulled and tugged and fragmented by the structure there. I think you certainly have to have uh, a military control. We haven't heard anything from the governor. The Associated Press started moving a story uh, about 20 minutes ago that the hydrogen bubble within the reactor is becoming unstable uh, and uh, could be dangerous. That would uh, cause a potential explosion, uh, and that's a very ominous sign. We are concerned, though, about the status of the fuel in the core. There's extensive fuel damage. How can you say it's not an accident when radiation is being detected as far away as 16 miles? The, the accident did not occur inside uh, the reactor in the slightest. It was a, uh, a feed pump uh, connected to the turbine outside of the reactor area. Now that was a failure of a piece of machinery and therefore it was an accident of a with regard to, it wasn't an accident, it was just a failure of a piece of machinery. There's also a bubble in the reactor vessel that means that any change in the hydraulics of the core have to be carefully monitored. So we're looking very carefully at the way the applicant intends to get the core to a cold shutdown condition. Uh, there's no relationship between that and what is thought of as a nuclear accident. The risk involved is that the gas would expand, prevent uh, cooling of the core, that we would suffer additional core damage, uh, and with the ultimate the risk of a meltdown. That risk is real. Uh, the risk, depending on the, the manner in which you figure out to uh, cope with this problem, could be, could be real. The most likely meltdown is, uh, would not result in early fatalities. It would, resort, it would result in exposure to the public that caused latent cancer uh, and uh, land uh, contamination and uh, how far? And, uh, probably uh, resulting in economic losses of a billion dollars. How, how so. far? Uh, for, the, for the most likely core meltdown, not very far. I can't come to any other conclusion than that early Wednesday, that reactor had a loss of coolant accident. And it would seem to me that the core may very well be in the process of melting right now. We were suggesting that people should uh, simply prepare themselves to stay inside. <sighs> to get... Uh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> to get thyroid blocking agents to drink bottled water. I think we were telling people we were expecting the worst. And I don't see how that has changed a bit. That we are just buying time and doing nothing. And I'm simply terrified. The release of radioactivity would be astronomical. People within a few miles would all die. Uh, there would be a hazard uh, of enormous uh, increase in cancer risk uh, out to anywhere from 20 to 100 miles in the downwind direction, and you'll really have to evacuate as many as possible, maybe a million people. That kind of evacuation probably won't be like uh, possible. Yes, but that's, of course, why the whole thing is stupid, because it is impossible. But you would try. And, of course, they might start evacuating, and the wind change direction, and then the, the cloud would blow right over. Well, I still don't feel too easy about it, because, uh, really, they are not telling the truth, I don't think. There's more to it than what uh, they said. What are you going to do? <laughs> Gotta keep away from it. <laughs> I can't <laughs> Have you been thinking about uh, leaving? You sure have. No. Why's that? Because I feel that the worst of the thing is over now. And I feel that before they told us, the worst was probably over when they told us. So I'm not leaving. They're going to still experiment with it anyway, so. What can it doesn't matter. Not really, because the money, man with the money is going to do what he wants anyway.
Westinghouse Electric, a leader in the nuclear power plant field, is down over a point in extremely heavy trading over the first million shares. General Public Utilities, a holding company, which owns the three miles. Well, thank you very much for being with us and keep doing the good work. Well, thank you. We just hope everyone else around the country will get mobilized by what we are doing. We feel that we have been relatively successful in keeping Unit 1 shut down and we just hope that people around the rest of the country take heart with what we are doing. From March of 1982, we switched to May of 1986 and Chernobyl. In the aftermath of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant catastrophe in the Soviet Union, The Guardian and In These Times present some historical background and perspective on this nuclear accident that you don't get in the regular press. The Guardian begins its story by pointing out that after the Three Mile Island catastrophe in the United States in 1979, the reaction in the Soviet Union was that, quote, it can't happen here, our technology is safer than theirs. The Soviets claimed that because socialist technology was not motivated by the profit motive, that their nuclear power plants had much more built-in safety devices and that a nuclear accident of the sort that happened at Three Mile Island couldn't happen in the Soviet Union because of superior safety procedures. In fact, as recent as the February issue of Soviet Life magazine this year, the Soviets wrote in an article that was indeed focused on the Chernobyl plant and its workers, they said in the Soviet Life magazine, the odds of a meltdown are one in 10,000 years, the article claimed. The plants, and I'm quoting directly, have safe and reliable controls that are protected from any breakdown with three safety lines. The environment is also securely protected. This, of course, is a lot of hot air in the aftermath of the catastrophe. But it's enlightening to note that in the United States, similar claims are being made for the safety of nuclear energy in the United States. The Wall Street Journal, Journal quotes a General Electric spokesperson saying that when things are analyzed, people will realize that U.S. systems have adequate safeguards. And another spokesperson for the nuclear industry in the United States says, the safety systems in U.S. plants are incredible which may have an ironic uh, irony and pun to it, <laughs> because in point of fact, there's no more safety in the United States than the Soviet Union. Oh, but we have containment vessels. Remember, they keep telling us on, the, uh, on television that we have containment vessels, and that'll save us from all those things that those, those uh, Soviets, uh, you know, inferior uh, installations have. Or, you know, they don't have those. Well, this is the claim that's being made in the United States, but I read a report that indicates that if there was a fire or a meltdown or an explosion of the sort that we now think happened at Chernobyl, it would go right through this concrete containment dome. It would blow sky high. The, this containment dome is only good for catching certain low-level radiation leaks. It can't really deal with a fire or an explosion or a major catastrophe. The defenders of nuclear energy in the United States and the safeness of U.S. power plants also ring hollow in their proclamations in the aftermath of three successive failures in our space program of the shuttle, space shuttle, of some of the rockets and the launches and the satellites. 
the last three that NASA has set up, there's been major failures. So to say that our technology is accident proof is just total nonsense. Doug, you, you notice how the from looking at the television, you think the accident had occurred in the United States because the uh, government and the pro new people were saying, well, you know, it's safe. It's really safe. Don't worry about it. It's okay. We're, we're okay here. And of course, I didn't see all the programs, all the newscasts, but of the many that I did see, there was only one that ever mentioned Three Mile Island. They mm -hmm. kept that very, very quiet. In fact, it's worth noting, to put this in historical perspective, that there's 101 commercial nuclear power plants operating in the United States and only 46 online in the Soviet Union. So we have twice as many power plants here in the U.S. than the Soviets do, which means twice as much potential for a nuclear disaster. There's also, in, in these times, a whole history of accidents in the United States, the Soviet Union, and other nuclear power plants across the world. As early as 1957, there was a major explosion at a military waste dump in the Ural Mountains of the Soviet Union in which the Russians were forced to evacuate 30 villages in the area. And 60 Minutes had a documentary, an expose on this, that shows pictures that indicate that even today it's a wasteland, that this whole region was just destroyed by this nuclear explosion in the Soviet Union. And there's been many other accidents in the Soviet Union. There were two in 1963. A breeder reactor on the Caspian Sea caught fire in 1974. There was serious problems with a power reactor in 1981. There's also been accidents in Soviet-built reactors in Finland and Czechoslovakia. But in the United States also, since 1960s, there's been eight major nuclear accidents in eight different states, including Michigan, Alabama, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, with Three Mile Island just simply being the most visible one. So in no way is this a safe um, energy form. There's also the danger of human error. Indeed, it's belief now, and the Soviets seem to indicate this, that the Chernobyl accident was instigated by a human error and failure. And in the United States, on TV, I've seen that we have all these simulation programs where people are trained to react to different accidents that might occur. But still, this doesn't rule out the possibility of human error. And there's also the dangers of sabotage or a terrorist attack. The pro-nuke people are still rampant and in the saddle all over the world. France has 25 reactors under construction. J Japan has 14, Czechoslovakia 10. And even Cuba and China are starting to build reactors and a lot of the places they get their reactor technology and the people who are building for them are people in the United States who can't find any jobs uh, here because we're getting a little bit smarter. And of course the insurance industry was very smart from the start. The insurance industry wouldn't uh, underwrite or insure any of the nuclear power systems in the United States, so that's why the government has to do it. So it seems that these nuclear plants are just simply insane because of their vulnerability to catastrophe, that this is just a completely <clears throat> sick way of gaining uh, energy. We remember Helen Caldicott, when she was on our program, said that, heck, you don't need to drop nuclear bombs on the Soviet Union. All you have to do is drop conventional bombs on their nuclear power plant. And the explosion would be so catastrophic that it would <laughs> yeah. wipe out uh, the area all around them. But the same argument holds for the United States. Exactly. We're just, any country that yeah. has nuclear power plants is incredibly uh, vulnerable. That's Alternative Views for this evening. We'd like to thank our director, Alan Bouchon, camera people, Roxanne Elder, and David Garbose for our interview. And for our news section, our camera person was Eric Eubank. Audio was performed by Kevin West. We'd also like to thank Austin Community Television, ACTV. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Good night.